Hi, can everyone hear me okay in the back? Awesome. Well, welcome. I'm going to jump in. We've got an action-packed uh, 40 minutes for you all. Uh, we're going to be talking about Firefly. Uh, just, just to help me, uh, could you just sh raise your hand if you've heard of Firefly before? Okay. Can you raise your hand if you're somewhat familiar with what Firefly is and what problem it's solving and how it could help? Okay. Awesome. You're in the right place. Um, let's jump in then. Uh, my name is Steve, uh, and I'll be covering the first half. I'll take you through some slides, an uh, overview of Firefly. And then Nico, my teammate, uh, who's one of the Firefly maintainers, is going to drive a, a live demo. And we'll see what the demo gods have in store for us today. Uh, yeah, so I just said overview, demo, hopefully we'll have some Q&A time, and if not, we'll hang out uh, up front to chat. So big, big picture, right? Over here on the right is the, the wild, wonderful world of Web3. We've kind of decomposed it into some different bubbles that probably make sense to you. Over on the left is your enterprise, right? The company that, that you work with, and you have a, a set of existing systems. And you want to build a Web3 application. Uh, and what this has looked like before Firefly, uh, which I'm calling the Gen 1 era of, of Web3, of enterprise blockchain, uh, of you know, your, these early blockchain applications, is to connect out to Web3, really, a lot of the Gen 1 is focused on that consortium bubble up there. Uh, and to do that, you, you may have stood up your own blockchain nodes, you may have used a, a cloud vendor service or a, a service from Kaleido or a company like us that was a Web3 infrastructure provider. So you got the node, great, but actually you're only 5% of the way there, right? Because your application, the little bubble, the Web3 applications that you want to build, still need a whole lot of software, a whole lot of code written to get your end-to-end -end solution up. And that code is pretty Web3 specific code. You, you, need to, you need to solve a lot of problems, and I'll, I'll get into that in a second. By contrast, uh, Firefly has come along for, for Gen 2. And in Gen 2, building your Web3 applications is a whole lot simpler. Not only that, but Firefly can help you to do more than just B2B consortium style blockchain, it can help you connect out to public chains and, and do lots of other things in the, the Web3 space. This is a lot more scalable approach. A lot of the companies that we work with say, hey, we have 30 Web3 use cases. And, and I always ask, how many are you working on right now? Well, two, but we have 30, right? And so Getting to a much faster build out of, of the applications, a lot high, higher quality. Um, you know, we just saw that there was an opportunity for a new open source project to accelerate and drive standardization across the board. Uh, and, and one thing that we noticed that if you look first on the right hand side of this slide, you know, what Firefly is not is it's not another blockchain protocol. We think the world has enough of those, the world has enough chains out there and so forth, and that's the dotted line here. Uh, but in between that and your business application is a whole software stack. And like, like many other areas of IT, you know, there's always a software stack. Uh, and when we looked at the space at, within Kaleido, we noticed there wasn't a single open source project out there that was trying to accelerate um, building the whole stack. And so what we saw, these Gen 1 projects, we saw them moving so slowly because all the budget for the project got sucked into building these middleware layers custom, one-off. Uh, almost as a side effect of trying to build your app, you had to build the whole stack, and it was just really inefficient. Uh, and so you know, the Clado actually seeded as, with an initial contribution into Hyperledger now. Many organizations uh, are involved. Uh, it's a, a very quick growing project um, moving forward. To give you an example of some of the, uh, some of the complexity around building your application, um, 
many of the considerations around how to build a decentralized architecture into your application, um, idiosyncrasies of, of the protocol, how to handle privacy, you know, the orchestration of transactions on these event-driven systems, doing that reliably, Man seeing a transaction through end-to-end. -end. Um, you know, the these are, are pretty hard problems, and Firefly handles them out of the box. And so you now have the wisdom of the herd of lots of other companies, you know, using this code, hardening it, all the benefits of an open source project. Uh, Firefly is multi-protocol, as you see on the right. So, um, you know, we sometimes say, we're not trying to be religious here. We understand there's multiple protocols uh, out there, and, and we didn't pick one. We actually are shaping Firefly to help insulate you um, from that choice and, and even give you flexibility if you need to evolve uh, your protocol choice going forward. This is um, a, a logical architecture for Firefly. You can see at the middle of it is the core, that orchestration engine. Uh, again, uh, blockchains are event-driven systems. And so uh, just the complexity of getting a transaction maybe into a pending pool, mined into a block, written to a chain, you know, and, and understanding that whole process. Um, your application not having to deal with that uh, is a big relief to the developers on your team, right? So the orchestration engine at the core of that, but you can see there's a whole framework of functionality that's, that's built around that. Uh, the three colorful boxes at the top are the API pillars. Uh, so there's an, there's an application, a set of APIs for, for building apps um, uh, with some, some cool capabilities there, which I'll dig into in a minute. The second pillar is for what Firefly calls flows. So what we see a lot of times, especially in enterprise applications, is not just on-chain activity, but off-chain activities as well. For example, data exchange going from B to B. Uh, and there's a whole set of APIs and patterns for how to coordinate off-chain and on-chain activities. Those are called flows. And then finally, digital assets. So an, an, an API pillar around making interacting with digital assets easy and simple. So, you know, uh, minting, transfer, burn, the, the standard tenants of, of managing a token, uh, having built-in wallets, plug point to bring your own wallet, um, uh, making things like transfers, uh, simple, moving from party to party. Uh, in addition, in the digital asset space, the uh, state and the data um, parts of the core work hand in glove. So if you're running Firefly in gateway mode and you're connecting out to Polygon and there's 2 billion NFTs out on the Polygon chain, but you only care about 1,000 of those, Firefly becomes your system of record. It's tracking the state out on all the chains, only the state that you care about. So it, it, it almost becomes your worldview and, and helps you to build uh, smart, intelligent applications. So I'm going to step through a couple of these uh, concepts in, in just a little more detail, and then we'll get on to the demo. Uh, on that first pillar of, of APIs, uh, building your apps. So one, one of the things that Firefly does that's pretty cool is you can teach Firefly about the smart contract that you've written. Uh, and so when you feed in your smart contract into Firefly, it hands you back a set of REST APIs so that when you build your application, you can just code to REST APIs. And that allows any developer uh, on your team to build Web3 apps. And the Web3 specialty then is constrained uh, just, or it's isolated just to the developer who's writing the smart contracts. So this allows your team to scale uh, and, and get solutions out more quickly. Uh, so another concept here is acting uh, as a gateway. Uh, so once, you've, once you're coding to these simple APIs, 
you can rely on the orchestration engine that's inside of Firefly to do all the heavy lifting for you. So, so you say, hey, I want to mint this token, or I, I want to put this transaction onto the chain. And then um, the 100,000 lines of code uh, of Firefly that, that manage these sorts of things uh, uh, kick in. Uh, and um, you know, this, again, Firefly can connect to multiple chains. So, so this uh, scales out to, hey, I have a fabric. I have one project that's based on fabric. I have another pro project that's based on Ethereum. Firefly can, can help simplify both of those projects for you. Moving on to the second pillar, uh, flows. Um, Firefly now in V.1.1 can be started up, either in consortium mode or it can be started up in gateway mode. If you start, up, start Firefly up in, in multi-party or consortium mode, um, it will instinctively want to connect out to other Firefly nodes in a consortium style B2B network. Um, and you can see that Firefly has both the blockchain rail that it knows how to interact with, as well as other off-chain rails. Uh, so things like IPFS for a shared storage layer, and then also a peer-to-peer -peer messaging layer. Uh, so, so Firefly can connect org A to org B in a private channel off-chain to exchange data, or org A to org D in a private channel to exchange data and so forth. Uh, and, and Firefly has an address book built into it as well. So all of the different identities, public, private key pairs, all of that is made simple for you uh, within the Firefly engine. So as the network dynamically changes over time, uh, the, the address book in this B2B network is going to be kept up to date. Uh, and the implementation for this is even based on uh, the DID spec. So uh, the community is looking towards the future and trying to pull in all kinds of cool technologies. So then moving on to the third pillar, just for a minute, thinking about digital assets here and talking about that. Um, here, the focus of the community is really on scale and thinking about institutional scale for digital assets. Um, you know, standing up a single coin is one thing, or, or minting an NFT is, is one thing. Uh, but really thinking about institutional scale opens up a whole new set of challenges. Um, so I was mentioning a minute ago things like the history, uh, tracking, automatically tracking the history of a token. So if, if you, um, if you mint a, a token through the, the API, it automatically gets registered uh, in the, the database that's part of the Firefly stack, uh, and that token history is tracked for you. You can also point f uh, Firefly, for example, at a public chain and a token that already exists and say, hey, pull in all the history of this token and track it uh, going forward. So almost like an audit trail or, or the, the lineage and the history of a token, and then you have an efficient way to query that going forward. As you know, uh, blockchains can be pretty slow uh, when you ask them questions. They're not really optimized or designed uh, for that, and so having um, all of that state uh, tracked for you in an in a efficient and fast query way uh, can be pretty handy. Uh, and then on wallets, uh, if you're in the financial services space, wallets are a pretty big deal. Uh, t tend to call the space custody, you know, who's managing the keys. Um, and, and Firefly co comes, similar to many areas of Firefly, it comes with an, a, a wallet or implementation for that, but it's also designed to be pluggable. So the community is looking at things like, well, you know, what, what, about, what are some popular wallets out there, and, and can we have plug points or integrations uh, in, into, those, into all of those wallets? It's something, again, that's important for institutional scale. I think we're going to do a questions at the end just uh, due to the time. Okay, I'm going to um, skip forward just a bit here. And uh, there are out on YouTube um, 
longer form uh, overviews of this. But I did want to touch on uh, Firefly 1.1. So, so coming out this week is uh, Firefly 1.1, sort of time to the event. There are a cute, cool few new things that I want to touch on just for a second. To give you a, an idea of the, the history of the project, um, it was launched initially as a Hyperledger lab uh, mid-2021. Uh, it, it was uh, then promoted a few months later to project status within a Hyperledger, again, due to the amount of interest and activity and, and um, engagement uh, through the community. Firefly, uh, uh, this, this, it was seeded by code uh, from Kaleido, um, which really was several years old and, and things that we've, was already in production code that, that we used uh, for, for a number of our clients' projects. Um, it moved to 1.0 status uh, this last April, uh, essentially reaching ready for, for production use or, or um, acknowledged for production use. And then just, just this week, uh, Firefly 1.1 is being cut. As it stands today, there's uh, 19 repos and about a quarter million uh, lines of code and growing. Over 1,000 new commits uh, came in between 1.0 and 1.1, and so a very active and growing project. What's new in 1.1? Uh, a few things. I talked about how Firefly now <coughs> runs in both, can, can, be, can run in either consortium mode or gateway mode. The idea with gateway mode is that you can connect out to many different chains uh, and, and have Firefly act as a gateway for all of those. Uh, in conjunction with that, Firefly now knows how to connect to a number of public blockchains um, through a, a, a new connector in the connector framework layer called EVM Connect. So if you're familiar with the Ethereum VM, um, uh, any EVM-based chain, uh, Firefly now knows how to connect with. And the additional complexities of public blockchains, things like gas management uh, uh, and, and, and other uh, areas of complexity, are now also baked in uh, to EVM Connect. So making it simple to connect to public blockchains. And there are very many uh, EVM-based chains out there. It's almost the de facto standard. Um, there are a number of, of guides in the docs for things like Polygon and Optimism, Arbitrum, uh, you know, Ethereum itself, and more. Uh, namespaces, so, so Firefly now can run multi-tenant. So what we've seen in large organizations is you have different teams you know, building different use cases and you want to keep those isolated. Uh, and, and now on, on Firefly, there's a degree of isolation that's called namespace. Um, which, you know, for, if you're familiar with things like Kubernetes, that's, um, you know, an, an isolation uh, technique on, on a lot of tools, and now, now it's there on Firefly. Um, there's a new connector toolkit, so it's really easy to build your own connector. Uh, the community is looking at self-service. I know that there are teams out there looking to contribute a connector. Hey, we're a layer one chain. It would be great if Firefly could connect to us we want to contribute uh, a connector. Uh, so expect to see more growth as far as the number of, of connectors uh, out there going forward um, and, and advancements in, in some other areas as well. So with that, I'm going to wrap up the overview portion and I'm going to um, turn it over to Nico to drive the demo. Thank you, Steve. Is this mic on? Can you guys hear me okay out there? Okay, great. Hello, everyone. My name is Nico Geyer. I'm a maintainer on Hyperledger Firefly and the open source community leader. I'm also a software engineer at Kaleido, and I'm really excited to talk about Firefly 1.1 and some of the really exciting new features in it today. Um, I see a couple of people have, have come in. There's, there's still some seats. If you guys want to um, take a seat, you're more than welcome to. So uh, thank you, Steve, for the, the great overview on, on Firefly. Uh, what I want to talk about today is some of the new stuff. So I'm gonna, I'll, I'll very briefly touch on existing features and how they relate to new features. 
Uh, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time demoing stuff that you may have already seen if you've seen a Firefly demo, because I like, I like new stuff. So what we're going to look at today is we're going to see a, a Firefly super node. And I'm running a super node on my laptop. I've used the Firefly CLI, and I've set up just a local development environment. And so that local development environment is using several different plugins. Uh, I'm using a SQLite database. I'm using... Uh, the data exchange plugin that comes out of the box, IPFS for my shared storage, and I'm using FabConnect. Uh, Jim Zhang gave a great session on FabConnect a little bit ago and how it makes using Hyperledger Fabric easier and providing a nice API layer for it. It's also a blockchain connector for Hyperledger Firefly. So, so my Firefly core talks to FabConnect, which talks to a Fabric network that's also running on my laptop. I've set this network up like a consortium. So there are actually multiple super nodes running on my machine that represent other organizations. So you have many different organizations collaborating with this same fabric network. And we can exchange data. Uh, we can pin data to the blockchain. We can privately exchange data uh, all through our super nodes. Uh, so this is, this is an example of what Firefly has done since launch, which is allowing you to build a consortium that uses blockchain as an integration point. Uh, or a multi-party network, as you may have heard us call it sometimes. So how does this change in 1.1? Well, Steve mentioned that now you can have multiple namespaces simultaneously. So here's the rest of my demo. I'm going to be using the same database. I'm using the same Firefly super node. Uh, but I'm actually going to also be connecting in a different namespace to an EVM Connect blockchain connector, which Steve also mentioned is the new uh, EVM-compatible blockchain connector for Firefly. It uh, uses a new open source uh, Ethereum signer called Firefly Signer. Uh, it's a, an Apache 2, very enterprise friendly license, and it's available as part of the, it, it can be used standalone or it can be used as part of Firefly as well. This stack is actually connected to the Polygon Mumbai testnet. So what I'm going to demonstrate is being able to run transactions privately in my Fabric consortium network and also interact with tokens or execute other smart contract functions on a very public, uh, permissionless Polygon testnet. So hopefully that makes sense. I, I, I think things make more sense. Um, like seeing pictures is great, but I like seeing things in action more. So let's actually do it. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slide over here. And OK, so this is, I, I've got two different colored browsers to represent two different Firefly nodes, two different organizations in my network. So over here, uh, you can see in the right-hand corner, I've got node one, and over here, I've got node zero. And they're just color-coded, so just visually, so you can see the difference. Um, if you look closely, you'll notice the, the, um, the, the port number is different. So I'm, I'm running two different super nodes on my computer to simulate an entire consortium running here, so I can build apps and, and use the consortium. So, if you've seen a Firefly demo before, I'm just going to very briefly touch on some of the things you can do with Firefly. Uh, the Firefly command line interface has set all of this up for me. Uh, I'm happy to chat through how that works later, but it takes some... I wanted to skip all that so we could get to the good part. So everything's already set up and running. Uh, the Firefly command line interface also sets up the Firefly sandbox. Sandbox is a great tool for being able to just really quickly, in a browser, uh, use Firefly. I, I can click a couple buttons and like try out different major features in Firefly. So uh, we kind of talked about the three pillars earlier, and you know, right across the top we have tabs for messages, tokens, and contracts. So those are kind of the, the three main sets of functionality, uh, the three main sets of APIs within Firefly. So I can send a message. Uh, I can broadcast a message. We'll say um, this. This is my demo. I have a hard time typing and talking at the same time. I don't know if you guys have that too. I hope it works. All right. So I'll publish that. This will run a batch pin transaction on my Fabric network. So uh, I, I could go hop over and look at my, my Fabric nodes, and I could actually see that. That got mined into a block on my Fabric channel that these Firefly nodes are configured to use. I can go to my Firefly Explorer. And I can see that you know, I just submitted a transaction here. My message was confirmed. I can go look at the off-chain data. So when, when you broadcast data in Firefly, the, the payload itself remains off-chain. The, uh, 
the fact that something was broadcasted is what goes onto the chain and triggers an event, which triggers other Firefly nodes listening for that event to know, hey, I have a message from somebody. Let me go retrieve that payload from IPFS and see what it was. So I can look in data and uh, I can click on this one. And here's my demo, hope it works. Let's go check out the other Firefly node running over here. So we'll, we'll look at the green one or, or node one. Uh, so we can see that there was a message that happened here as well. Let's go check to make sure we also got the data payload. We can look under off-chain data. And yeah, this is my demo. I, I hope the rest of it works too. Okay, so you know that's this is nothing new uh, from, from Firefly 1.0, but just wanted to I just wanted to demonstrate that like everything that was there is still there. But here's what's new. So now uh, in my Explorer, I also have this dropdown up here. And this, this lets me switch between different namespaces that I have in, in my Firefly node. So, so my Firefly node in this demo is the red one. Um, the imaginary other organization that I'm communicating with is the green one. So the green one only has its default namespace, which is the one that's configured to talk to the Fabric network, our consortium namespace. If we go look at my red node, I notice that I have the default namespace that's connected to the Fabric. I also have a polygon namespace that I've set up. If I hop over to that polygon namespace, uh, we'll notice the, the my node diagram looks different because I'm using a different set of plugins. Uh, we'll notice that there's some different pieces of data in here. Uh, also before this demo, I went ahead and I deployed a, an ERC20 contract to Polygon Testnet. Um, we can hop over here and we can take a look at that. So here's, here's the contract address. Um, this is public. You can go to this URL right now on your machine and you can see my contract. You can see that I deployed it. Um, we can see that it was first in this particular transaction at that particular block number. And then what I did is I went and I created a token pool in Firefly. And that was super easy. Uh, I just went to the Swagger UI, scrolled down here to the token pool endpoint. Um, there's a lot of these now. Um, I'm just going to search real quick to find it faster. Pools. So there are a couple sets of, there's a, a set of endpoints if you're using the default namespace and there's a set of endpoints where you can fill in a custom namespace, which is what we had to do. So I just came down here and I did a, a post to, yep, here it is, tokens pools, and that set up a token pool. Now what that does is it, it uses Firefly's token connector to go index the chain. So Steve talked about earlier, you know, blockchains aren't necessarily uh, efficient for queries that they're not designed to make. And one of those is, get me the entire history of this token and everything that's happened on it since the beginning of whatever block number that was that we just looked at. So when I did that earlier in the day, what happened in the background was Firefly set up a job through the blockchain connector through EVM Connect that went and it started at the first block and it said, okay, I'm gonna go query the blockchain and I'm gonna build that whole history. And so um, that's already happened. So if we go look in our dashboard, we can see uh, under tokens, we can go see our token pool that's here and it has, so I've, I've deployed this thing, I, I called it FFC, Firefly coin, if you will, um, and there's, there's 100 of them. I don't know, maybe that font, is, is, it, is it hard to read in the back of the room? Okay, I'll zoom in a little bit here, maybe not that much, okay. The, uh, the responsive UI was kicking in there, I thought I was on a phone because I zoomed in so much. Um, so yeah, so there's 100 of them here. We can see that there was, there was one mint action that's taken place and that's it. So um, to demonstrate that this really is a public chain and that this all really works and I can actually transfer tokens with this, um, I, I have a, a wallet on Polygon Testnet that I'm gonna transfer to. Um, I, I would love some audience participation though. Does, uh, just by happenstance, does anyone have an Ethereum wallet configured on a Polygon Testnet? And I, I can give you some, some FFC right now if you want as a souvenir. Andrew, do you? All right, never mind. I'll, I'll, I'll send it to my MetaMask. That's fine. Uh, I, I, it was a long shot, but... Okay, so uh, over on this other desktop over here. Okay, I've got my MetaMask wallet. Um, I have some... This is configured to use Polygon Testnet. Uh, I don't really own 200 Matic. Uh, well, actually, I, I do, but it's in a different wallet. Um, <laughs> um, so, so this one is configured to use Polygon Testnet. You can see I, own, I have zero FFC though. So I've, I've told MetaMask, hey, here's my contract address on a Polygon Testnet. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna copy my account address here. And I'm gonna go over to my Swagger UI. And I'm gonna go down to the transfer. 
endpoint. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create a token transfer here. All right, so I'm going to hit try it out. My namespace is Polygon. Uh, most of this I don't need, so I'm actually just going to type out what I do need. Uh, I'm going to transfer it to my, this is my MetaMask address. I'm going to transfer it from, um, I'm going to go look that up here. My, yeah, so this is my, this is the address that I use to deploy. The contract, it's also the address that my Firefly node is configured to use. So I, I have the private key for this address on my Firefly signer. That's, that's kind of how that works behind the scenes. So I'm going to copy this address here. So this is the address that owns the, the currently uh, only existing 100 FFC that, that exists on this chain. And uh, save this from this address, and then we're going to say the amount is, so, so for the amount, um, uh, just, just quick background information here if you aren't super familiar with how ERC-20 works, um, there's, there's a, a configured number of decimal places. So the Ethereum EVM uh, only works in integer math. So if you want to represent a decimal, you have to add a whole bunch of zeros to everything and then divide by the appropriate number of decimals. So my contract is configured to use 18 decimals, so if I wanted to transfer 10, I would actually do 10 followed by 18 zeros. Um, so that's, that's why I'm going to type a super long number here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Okay, so that should transfer 10 tokens. And then we will hit execute. Okay, we got a 202 back, which means it has accepted my token transfer, and it will happen in the background. So what's going to happen now is... That will get submitted to uh, my remote RPC node that I've configured uh, to, to talk to the Polygon testnet. Uh, I've configured my EVM connector to wait for four confirmations. So what that means is uh, I need to know, because this is a, a public chain, so it's, the behavior of it is wildly unpredictable. Um, what that means is I, I want to wait to know that I get four consecutive blocks mined on the chain that all have my transaction in them. And so I, for this test net, I've determined just arbitrarily that, that four is sufficient. But uh, for a, a network or that may be more unpredictable or maybe you want even more guarantee, you could set that confirmation number much higher. It means it will take much more, uh, much more time before we consider the transaction to be definite or that it's not going to be reverted or that we're not going to get conflicting blocks and have to rewind the blockhead. Um, there's, so there's a bunch of really complex stuff that's happening behind the scenes in the blockchain connector right now. And so um, it's, probably, it's probably finished. Uh, we could go hop over to look at our contract here. And we'll refresh this page. Okay, yeah, so there was a minute ago, there was another transfer here. So there was a transfer from, and uh, there's, there's my, my addresses. And if I go hop over to my Firefly Explorer... Uh, I get this refresh button now, and I can see now there is a new account that has a balance of 10, and my, my Firefly nodes balance has decreased to 90. So that transfer was successful. Now let's go look at MetaMask. So my MetaMask wallet is in no way, shape, or form connected to Firefly. It's connected to the blockchain over the public internet. And if we go look at MetaMask now, yeah, I think it's on this desktop, now it says we've got 10. And so if I wanted to, I could transfer, uh, if I knew someone else that had uh, a Polygon testnet wallet, I could transfer some of these 10 tokens there. And because my Firefly node is indexing this token, that transfer would show up there as well. So Firefly is now aware of all of the transactions that happen on this public chain. So uh, that's kind of what I wanted to highlight for the, for the demo. This, this hits on a bunch of the new features in Firefly. Uh, it touches on multiple namespaces. It touches on... Uh, both public and private chain interactions at the same time in the same Firefly node, multiple namespaces, and, and a bunch of other really cool things that all combine together to make a really powerful platform to build blockchain apps. Thanks for coming out today. Uh, we've got about five minutes, and we'll take some questions now, and uh, really appreciate you coming. Thank you. Hey, my questions primarily center around identity and access control. So that Swagger UI tab, you were able to go in there and execute that transaction without authentication. Is there a 
an access control you can put on top of that that says, okay, you need to have this, and, and if so, what, what sort of controls do you support there? Yeah, absolutely, great question. So for context, this is a local development environment. It's running on my laptop, which is why I, there's no HTTPS, it's all local host. Um, so new in Firefly 1.1 is pluggable API security. So there is a basic auth plugin that's built in. You can configure it at the HTTP listener layer, so you can say, I want username and password on you know, everything. Uh, you can configure it on the namespace layer. So you might have one team in your organization that is working within a certain namespace, and you give them one set of credentials. You may have another team that's working in another namespace. So you can separate them that way. Uh, because it's a plugin, anyone can write a, an authorizer for Firefly and plug into any kind of user authentication system they want. Um, you know, other options also include some sort of network appliance in front of Firefly, like a reverse load balancer that um, handles the auth you know, outside of the process as well, but there's, there's options for both. We, we like to try to be generic, as Steve said, we don't try to be religious or prescribe like, you know, this is the technology that you should use, but uh, try to be open to allowing integrations to, to many different forms of authentication. Thank you, and then on a similar vein, I assume that inside of the Ethereum connector, that's where you put the, the, the key pair, or at least the, the wallet that, that controls access to the key pair for the on-chain contract, is that correct? So there's, there's two pieces to the Ethereum architecture. Um, if we look at, I'll just pull up the diagram again. So uh, EVM Connect is the blockchain connector. Uh, Firefly Signer is the, so these are both Docker containers that are running on my machine. Uh, technically speaking, Firefly Signer is the one that actually my private key is inside that container. And uh, that's, that's where transactions get signed, and the, the private key never leaves that, that space there. Okay, and then I see this Fabric Consortium Network, and there's a connection there from Fab Connect. So then is there some notion of identity that goes beyond the Fabric Network that sort of identifies an account inside of Firefly uh, across both the, the ETH, EVM Connect and the Fabric Consortium Network? Yeah, it's a great question. I probably don't have time to go in. Identity is a big topic. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so, Firefly, so Fabric obviously has Fabric organizations within the Fabric network. Mm -hmm. uh, Firefly also has a concept of an organization that can map one to one or one to many with Fabric identities as well. Um, within this public chain namespace, uh, that's less relevant because I'm, I, I'm using this in what we call gateway mode, where this is just it's just a, uh, an appliance, a, an API gateway that I've set up where my organization can talk to a public chain. Um, so identity, is, those sorts of org identities and node identities are less relevant in that, in that space. My last question on identity is, is there a new, is, is it just essentially username and password authentication with Firefly or is there also, I, you mentioned pluggability, is there the, some notion of a key pair? that provides some sort of access similar to how Fabric does or other, other networks do? Yeah, so good question. So API authentication and identity are completely separate. So like the, the, actual, um, the actual identity that I sign a transaction and put on the blockchain is not necessarily tied to like the API credentials that are, like you could have a different set of API credentials to access a certain namespace. They can be obviously like maybe a certain team has an identity that they use when they sign transactions, but they're, they're, they're two distinct concepts within Firefly. So then a small follow-up is, is the API credential like an API access key that's different? It's not necessarily an identity, just like a... Yes. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yep. All right. Um, yeah, so for an enterprise, they're going to have their own PKI system. And you mentioned briefly a signer. Um, is that something that, that would enable um, uh, Firefly to be talking to the PKI, like to help people set that up? Or does that need to be, yeah? Yeah. Do you want to so, elaborate on that? So I'm sorry. What Can you elaborate on that? So, the, so Firefly signer is relatively new. It's a, a new, it, is, it was first released in 1.1, which uh, came out a couple hours ago. Um, it is, it, but there are going to be more, um, the ability to plug into different types of key management systems. Um, but yes, the, the goal is like it's it's a very enterprise friendly license where some some other signing uh, things are maybe a little bit trickier uh, around licensing. Um, it's written in GoLang and it's it's meant to be extensible as well. Great. Do you have educational material? 
Yes, uh, there, there are, um, so the docs are a great resource. Um, if you go to, uh, I believe it's, it's linked in our, um, it's pinned in Discord. If you go to, it's uh, hyperledger.github.io slash Firefly. Uh, these are the main docs for Firefly. Uh, this is a great place to start learning. Um, full disclosure, we have a lot more docs that we should write. <laughs> um, they're, they're coming soon. But uh, yeah, this is a great place to start. Yeah, I just want to add one thing on uh, organizational identity. So PKI is existing organizational identity. Um, some of these Web3 technologies are, didn't, don't use PKI at all. So the, the uh, ETH signer there, Ethereum does, has no concept of PKI. What it uses is Ethereum addresses. Um, so in, 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 that, in that sense, um, Firefly is providing the plugins for the right key management solution. For, for Fabric, which is PKI based, um, you know, Fi Firefly knows how to connect to Fabric and interact with it. What Firefly does is it accumulates all of that uh, identity information into an address book. So when you're in consortium mode, you, you, uh, your Firefly node will create an address book of all that PKI information for all the different organizations that you connect to. I think we had one more question and then we'll hang up, we'll let you all go and we'll hang up, up out front for you. <clears throat> As you mentioned before, uh, you're storing the data from different token transfers, etc. So, is the as we are on an enterprise level, is the database uh, uh, selectable? So you can select either SQL, non-SQL, etc. Implementations. So today there is a plugin for SQL style databases. Uh, the specific so th there's a plugin today for Postgres. There's a plugin today for SQLite. When you set up the development environment, the default is SQLite just to not have an, yet another Docker container running. Um, in, in production, you probably want to run Postgres. But it's very easy to add a plugin for a different type of SQL database. Um, perhaps a NoSQL database will come down the road, but um, we, it, it doesn't currently support NoSQL databases for, for, its, for Firefly's internal uh, database, which is, is really sort of the, the current state of the world. That being said, there's also a shared, a separate, separate from the database, there's also shared storage is what we call it, which the current implementation of that is IPFS. So if you want to store blobs of JSON or binaries or, or whatever you want, uh, those, those are good IPFS. Good question. Cool. Really great questions. Thank you all for coming out. I think we're a few minutes over, um, so we'll let you all go, but we'll hang out here if there's any more questions, thanks. Thank you.